the Hutt Valley, which is also known as the Southern War, and the war in Wellington was a series of conflicts from January 1846 to the 10th of August 1846 between the colonial government and its armed forces backed by a settler militia against local Murray tribes of the Wellington region. While comparative to other conflicts in New Zealand at the time, the conflict claimed few lives. The real significance of the conflict was a reassurance from Governor Sir George Grey to New Zealand's settler population that he could handle the local Maoris and was looking after their needs. This was shown to them by Grey's handling of the First Northern War and then the Southern War. It also opened the way for European settlers to come into the Hutt Valley and for the first time build houses and settlements without local Māori opposing them. This means that the Hutt Valley we know today and the cities of Upper and Lower Hutt would not have been the same without the Southern War and the steps the top conflict took to eject Māori from the area. It is also an event which still affects people today as evidenced by the recent 70 million claim from the Crown to Ngāti Toa where Chiefs Te Ranga Haita and Te Rapuha are from. To look at the conflict in the Hutt Valley, you must first understand how tensions between Māori and Europeans rose to boiling point and led to conflict in the area. The underlying reason for war in the Hutt Valley was the poor handling of land sales between the New Zealand Company and the local Māori who lived in the area and owned the land. In September 1839, William Wakefield, who was head of the New Zealand Company and driver behind the Wellington settlement, met with local Te Atiawa chiefs Te Puni and Te Whirapori in Petonia on the northern shore of Port Nicholson, where they negotiated the sale of land which Wakefield understood to be all the land south of the south coast and the Tauru Range, the islands in the harbour and part of inland Poirua. The deal was translated by Richard Barrett, a larger-than-life man who was literate and a seller. He and Wakefield's zeal on the purchase are summed up by James Cowan in his 1922 book, New Zealand Wars in the Pioneering Period, when he states, Richard Barrett, the whaler and trader, upon whom they placed reliance as an interpreter and go-between, was literate and his knowledge of Maori tongue scarcely extended beyond colloquial phrases. Wakefield does not appear to have given any close attention to the validity of the native vendor titles, so long as he found a chief or gathering of chiefs willing to sell such and such area of bush, mountain and plain, he was satisfied." End quote. While this all may have been true, Barrett was married to, the, married to a daughter of Te Atiawa chief, and given Wakefield was neg negotiating with Te Atiawa, Barrett to seem like a logical go-between. The other reason for using Barrett and what I believe was a major force in the hurried and illegitimate nature of the purchases was the fact that before any land had been purchased, there were already two ships who had left London bound for Wellington. This coupled with the rumours that Britain was intending to annex New Zealand and impose a system of Crown preemption, meaning only the Crown could purchase land of Māori, would have no doubt rushed through the purchase to get land before settlers arrived and the land was no longer available to be purchased, and does explain Wakefield's hurried actions. One of the problems with the majority of land deals in New Zealand up to this point was the different values around the sale of land and what this meant. In Māori society there was no concept of absolute ownership of land because a number of whānau could all have different rights to the same piece of land where they all used the land for food gathering, hunting and agriculture on the shared area of land. The European view of total ownership by a single party is where the problems began and the problem was the fact that while they may have negotiated the purchase of land with a Māori chief, there may be another five who also had claims to the land and should be compensated. In the case of the Port Nicholson purchase, all of these problems were prevalent, and the fact that Wakefield met with Te Atiawa chiefs Te Puni and Te Whirapo, but not any of the Ngāti Toa chiefs such as Te Rapuha and Te Ringa Haita when purchasing the land was a major problem of the original purchase. The other main problem with the purchase was the fact that Murray believed all along that despite the purchase of the land, they were not giving up their own continued use of the land. The next cause of the war in the Hutt Valley was the poorly handled compensation by Commissioner William Spain of the original land purchases in Port Nicholson. In 1841, the Crown appointed William Spain as a land claims commissioner to investigate all purchases of land prior to the signing of the treaty. The New Zealand Company was not at all happy with the fact that the validity of their purchases were being questioned and uncooperative for Spain and his land claims commission. In 1844, Spain told the New Zealand Company that not all their purchases in the Wellington area were valid and they must further compensate local Murray chiefs to complete the land deals. Local chiefs to Upper High and to Ringa Haita each received £400 for what the New Zealand Company believed was purchase of the Hutt Valley. However, Ngāti Tama and Ngāti Rangatai received neither land nor money in compensation for the New Zealand Company or the Crown. The old saying, a compromise pleases no one, holds true with Spain's rulings. For set the newspaper at the time, the New Zealand and Wellington Spectator had this to say about Spain. Please note that when the paper refers to he, they are referring to Commissioner Spain. Now had Colonel Wakefield acquired the confidence of Rapaha and Rangatahayata, and he had paid the natives between this and Whanganui in the early part of last year as he was under contract to do so, does any man believe we should have had to record the Waira massacre? 
The natives would have had been in good humour, and upon hearing that Wyra was being surveyed, they would have felt, as the survey had been conducted on the side of the Cook Strait, without damaging their right to compensation, the survey might be made on every foot of it and all the islands, without invalidating their titles in the smallest degree. No, that bloody deed would have never been put on record. His very nature appears now hateful to the settler population." End quote. This quote shows the grievances that he and the local settler population had towards Spain. The next letter is from Nadi Toa chief to Rapraha to Commissioner Spain regarding Spain's recent compensation of £400 to himself and to Ringa Haita. In the letter, to Rapraha says, You and Mr Clark say that I am a false man, but I have told no falsehood. On the contrary, you two are confounded out negotiations, given the large payment to Nati Yawa. I indeed said that Pomier and I should receive payment for Port Nicholson, and you two reduced the payment for Ringa Haita, the man who the land belongs. Besides, you are mixing up with the payment for the hut with that of Port Nicholson. It was said, when you have given us the payment for Port Nicholson, and that is settled, we will give it, we will negotiate about the hut. You two want to grab all and take the land, giving but little payment. I tell no lies, it is you who have told lies. End quote. It is clear from the source and the previous settler source that all Spain did was antagonise all parties when his job was to sort out problems and reduce tensions. However, it is clear to see he only increased tensions. I believe Spain was a key factor in the war in the Hutt Valley as he had an opportunity to sort out and reduce tensions, but instead he got it very wrong. Evidence of just how wrong Spain and Wakefield conducted the purchase of the Hutt Valley in Port Nicholson is evident from the Waitangi Tribunal findings. The findings of the Waitangi Tribunal, with Nadi Toa were finalised and signed off on the 11th of February 2009, 165 years after Spain compensated for the sale of the Hutt Valley in Port Nicholson. One issue with the original 1839 Port Nicholson sale was Wakefield sold to, among other chiefs, Te Kaia of Nati Rangatahi. Section 2.6.7 of Te Whanganui Ataru report discussion and findings on the customary interests. The Waitangi Tribunal states that Nati Rangatahi are not included on the take rapporteur to Port Nicholson because, by their own admission, they acted on behalf of Nati Toa and were not fully independent prior to the arrival of the Crown. End quote. This excerpt shows how the original problems began with land purchases. In section 19.4, Clements entitled to remedies, the Waitangle Tribunal admits the Crown's failings in their land deals and says, in relation to the unsold remainder of land, some 120,626 acres, we recommend that Nati Toa, along with Te Atiawa, Nati Tama, Taranaki and Te Nati Ram Nui, should be compensated by the Crown. And, given the relative complexity of the issues and interrelationships of Māori groups affected, by a number of our treaty breach findings, the parties, having settled the question of their own representation, should enter negotiations with the Crown. We recommend accordingly. End quote. The negotiations ended with a compensation fee of seventy million six hundred ten thousand New Zealand dollars, which was paid to Nati Toa following the report. What is evident from these two excerpts is the complexity of the Wellington region and the tribes which live within the region. While there has not always been several tribes living in the Wellington, following the eighteen thirty musket wars, Iwi and their boundaries changed dramatically. From the musket wars, there were over 40 migrations of Maori groups, which include the 1921 migration of Nari Toa from Kafai in the Wellington region to Wellington, following the fighting against Te Whiru Whiru, and Te Atiawa, who migrated from Taranaki to Wellington. While the musket wars did accelerate the process, the movement of Maori tribes was on a new process. What the land deals between Europeans and Murrays did, which includes the purchase of Port Nicholson and the Hutt Valley by Wakefield, was essentially freeze which was a very dynamic process of iwi movement. By 1839 there were six major tribes in the Wellington region. This photo shows all the major iwi in the Wellington region. What, what this shows is the complexity of the task which Wakefield had when trying to make sense of who owned the land and what chiefs needed to talk in order to purchase the land. While it been said that it was Wakefield's failings when purchasing the land, what is evident is while, it, while he got it wrong, you could hardly blame him for not understanding the complex land ownership in the Wellington region, what even today is very rarely clearly defined or worked out. Governor George Grey came to Wellington in February 1846, and within two months, the first deaths of the conflict, those of Andrew Gillespie and his young son, had occurred. His arrival in Wellington with 800 men was in many ways a ton of brick which broke the camel's back. Because while a conflict had been building for six years, George Grey and his reckless actions were the main callous for the war and the immediate cause. Grey turned his attention from the northern moor to the Hutt Valley following the subjugation of Honihiki and Kalfiti and arrived in Wellington with 800 men of the 58th and 99th Regiments under Major Last on the warships, the Diver and the Calipi. Grey then met with the other Maori chief in the area, Ka Paratehau, the chief of Ngāti Rangatai. He and Takaya, 
demanded they must be compensated for the 300 acres of potato growing land which Grace said he would not discuss until they left the Hutt Valley. On the 25th, Karapitahau and his people left the Hutt Valley, and immediately on the 27th, Europeans and British troops ransacked Karapitahau's village and in the process destroyed the village chapel and burial place in the process. The aggrieved Ngāti Rangatai, led by Kaparatehau, retaliated by raiding settlers' farms in the Hutt Valley on the 1st and 3rd of March, where they killed livestock, destroyed furniture, and smashed windows. On the 2nd of April, 1846, Andrew Gillespie and his young son were attacked and killed by Ngāti Rangatai. The Gillespies had been attempting to farm some land which Ngāti Rangatai had been recently ev evicted from. This marked the start of the Southern War proper and was a reflection of the stubborn actions of George Grey. The Northern War with Kafiri and Honeheke was on the brink of a peace agreement founded by his predecessor Fitzroy when Grey sent 1,300 men to attack Murray at Ruapekapeka. When negotiating with Ka Paratehau and Te Kaea, he would not give them something which seems perfectly reasonable, 300 acres of potato growing land. Instead, when they had evacuated, he has allowed his men to ransack the villages, which in hindsight seems a very deliberate act. After all, you do not bring 800 men with you if you only want to negotiate with your foe, you intend to fight. Gray also knew the Māori value of utu, and knew that violence such as destruction of the chapel and destroying Māori burial grounds and chapel was only going only to end in one way, retaliation from the Māori. This is a common theme of confrontation and violence, which we see from Gray, and we see with Gray's predecessor, Governor Fitzroy's handling of the Waira massacre, that there is another way. Here Fitzroy enraged the local settlers by investigating the incident and determined that Ngāti Toa had been provoked and took no further action against Māori. This avoided any further conflict with Māori, as he did not feel the need to use force at any stage, which is the polar opposite to Governor Gray's actions. The Southern War itself involved a number of small-scale conflicts between Māori and Europeans from George Gray's British Army force and the local militia. The two key battles of the war were with the conflict at Belcourt's farm, where over 200 Māori, which involved during a Hayata and his warriors, attacked a British outpost at Belcourt's farm, where a young century and four lookouts were killed before the outpost of 45 British soldiers started to fight back. Total killed was six men with a further two dying later from their wounds. The other key battle began on the 31st of July when a 213 strong combined force of Hutt militia, armed police, set off to launch an attack on Tarangahaita's stronghold Pa at Pahata Hanui. However, it was discovered the Pa was deserted. On the 6th of August, Tarangahaita's other secret stronghold on the steep ridge on what is now known as Battle Hill was discovered. The force which assaulted the park consisted of British Army regulars, seamen from the Kalope, militia, armed police, and several hundred Māori allies from Te Atiawa, supported by a detachment of pioneers armed with axes. Three British soldiers were killed in a skirmish, and the next day they brought up a mortar and fired over 80 shots at the par. On the 10th of August, it was discovered that the par had been asserted by Rangi Hayata under the cover of rain and darkness, and Major Lars declared a great British victory. While he was pursued, Teringa Haita was eventually allowed to settle in the swap land at Poro Tafau, which is bit between the Horofenua and Manawatu. The first consequence of the Southern War was the retreat of Rangi Haita to his new power at Poro Tafau, where he lived in relative isolation, and years later even began to help the colonial government. After his retreat from Battle Hill, Rangi Haita and his people settled and made par on a swap land at Poro Tafau. After this, it's hard to get any real evidence or even mentions of his existence for many years because he and his people were largely kept to themselves. After a number of years or of agitation and conflict with other Maori tribes in the central North Island to the Wellington region, and finally with Pakeha in the Southern War, his people did, however, suffer from starvation, and his request to other Waikato troops was ignored. In 1847, he did raid Kapiti Island, but other than this, remained in what has been described as his quintessential swampy retreat. Later in life, however, his view towards European and European expansion, something which he previously was fiercely against, softened. This excerpt from Mr. M. Lean on the 20th of October 1852 shows the change of heart in Rangi Haita. It will be found that Rangi Haita, a chief once celebrated as, re as a rebel, and then, then says, the mere intention of constructing roads excited his indignation to such an extent that he endeavoured on several occasions to stop not only the construction, but even the use of the roads. M. Lean then goes on to say, is, at his own expense, opening up the country by excellent roads constructed wholly by the natives." End quote. What is clear is the dramatic change in, of Rangi Haita in later years from colonial government antagonist to protagonist and road, road builder, although his new European buggy, provided courtesy of Governor Gray, may have been a small incentive in the construction of these roads. Another consequence of the Southern War was the arrest of Tarapraha. 
It was a significant event in New Zealand history as it was the first step in Grey removing the strong Ngāti Toa influence in the area and rectifying what Grey saw as Fit Fitzroy's peaceful tolerance to, to, of Tarapraha following the Wairau incident. Grey wanted to arrest Tarapraha for two main reasons. First, as aforementioned, was backlash to the 22 settlers who had died in the Wairau incidents, which Tarapraha led. In my opinion, Grey wanted to reassure settlers of the Crown's power and influence where Fitzroy, Fitzroy had failed in dealing with the Wairau incident. Gray also wanted to arrest Tarapaha to reduce the Ngāti Toa influence in the area. Historian Philip Temple also mentioned that Gray considered it too risky to assault Pahataha Nui with Tarapaha and a count of four from behind him with the threat of a Whanganui war party coming down the coast to assist Tarapaha. End quote. The official line from Gray was that Tarapaha was arrested for supplying weapons to Māori who were in rebellion against the Crown. However, you can see from Gray's ulterior motives that this was just a convenient excuse and not the reason. The story of the arrest of Tarapraha is one which traditionally has been glossed over or even ignored owing to the fact some of the details are not what you would consider appropriate for dinner time conversation or any mid to early 20th century history book. The story goes, as Philip Temple and Front of Dreams, two much more recent 21st century publications tell, that on the evening of the 22nd of July, Gray went to arrest Tarapraha. Philip tells the story of his capture when he quotes Wards. Tarapraha was surprised as he slept, naked between his two wives and coated with red orc and oil, shouting, Nati Toa, Nati Toa, and binding the blue jacket's arms, the naked and well anointed cannibal twisted like a basket of eels. Even at four to one, his kidnappers were not able to make him fast until one of them grabbed his privates and held on. Tarapraha was detained for 18 months without trial in what has been described in every source as an illegal detention. This again shows evidence of Grey taking the law quite literally into his own hands, with disregard for the native Maori population and any ill effects they might feel, as he is solely focused on his job and lets nothing get in his way. The final consequence of the Hutt Valley War is one which has shaped Wellington and principally the Hutt Valley as we know it today. Once the major power in the area, Ngāti Toa and the two powerful chiefs of Tarapaha and Tarangatai had left and there was not an opportunity for Grey and the New Zealand Company settlers who were arriving by the boatload to settle the Hutt Valley and shave it into not what we know as the cities of Upper and Lower Hutt today. What the Southern War had done, just as the Northern War beforehand, had changed the balance of power in the region, where the local ones in the colony had started to emerge and pastoralists began to expand into the Hutt Valley as they had never been able to do before with the strong Māori presence. While things had started out well for the New Zealand Company, by 1852 they were debt ridden and struggling to stay afloat, which prompted the sale of all the New Zealand Company's land, all 1 million acres, for £268,000 purchased by the Crown and became the first official charge of land revenue for New Zealand. The period of Wellington region's history from 1847 to 1860 was one of great change where the region saw a shift in the balance of power, which was largely in conjunction with the rest of New Zealand as settlers continued to arrive to the island. There is a distinct lack of information around this time, and only key ideas are expressed which is most probably owned to the lack of large historical events and more a period of slower economic change and cooperation which has been described by James Ballot when he says about the Wellington region. The period of 1848 to 1860 was characterised as much by economic cooperation as by friction between the races." End quote. Using Christine Council's five-hour model, I've assessed the significance of the Southern War and put it into context with other conflicts at the time. In Council's model, the five criteria are remarkable, remembered, resulted in change, resonant and revealing. The first criteria of this is remarkable, and how remarkable it was at the time, or since, and remembered, which is how it was important at some stage in history within the collective memory. The first thing to establish when looking at the Southern War is not it is, it is not the most well remembered conflict in New Zealand at the time, and certainly today is a lot less well known than other conflicts such as the Northern War. I believe the first reason for the Southern War not being as remembered as the Northern Wars or the New Zealand Wars conflicts such as the First or Second Taranaki Campaign or Titakaro's War is the death toll. In the Flagpole War, there was 167 people killed on both sides. In the First Taranaki War, 438. In the Tauranga War, 167 people. In the Titakaro's War, over 50 people. And in the invasion of the Waikato, over 1,700 people lost their lives on both sides. This is a very large figure, and makes the es estimated 15 people killed in the Hutt Valley campaign seem very insignificant. This is the first reason which I believe the conflict is not as well known as other conflicts during the time. The other reason I believe the conflict is not as well known as other conflicts in New Zealand wars is it was not remarkable compared to other conflicts in New Zealand wars. It did not have the highest death or casual count, it was not the first or last conflict in the New Zealand wars, and it did not involve the greatest number of people or tribes. 
a conflict over ownership of land between Ma Europeans and Māori following land deals which ended in a positive shift in colonial power are all motifs which are carried on throughout the New Zealand wars, which is I believe the Southern War is not as well known as other of the New Zealand wars, and in fact one of the least well known. How this conflict is remarkable and remembered, however, is for the people of the Wellington region, because what the conflict undeniably did was shape Wellington to how we know today, for better or for worse, from the outcome of the war. The Southern War resulted in change by the consequences of the conflict. It made Dati Tour, before the tribe with the greatest influence in mana in the region, a tribe with little influence in the area, and sent its two chiefs, Te Rapraha and Te Rangahaita, to Auckland as a prisoner and to the swamps, and to the swamps of Poro Te Fau, respectively. What it did was open up the Hutt Valley to European expansion and shaped it into the Hutt Valley we know today. While the Wellington colony did not expand at the same rate as its counterpart, Auckland, what it did result in was a change in power in the region from Māori Toa, and by extension Māori, to Europeans. This means that the Hutt Valley and the cities of Upper and Lower Hutt we know today would not have been the same without the Southern War and the steps it took to remove the Māori from the area and left room for keen settler pastoralists to use the area. It is also still remembered today by the Ngāti Toa tribe and the Crown because in February 2009 the Crown acknowledged their wrongdoing of Ngāti Toa 150 years later by paying $70 million in compensation to Ngāti Toa for the land they had lost wrongly and the illegitimate land deals. The Southern War does not, compared with other conflicts in the New Zealand wars, have a resonant quality, which means people make analogies with the conflict, and is one criteria of Christine Council's five R's which the Southern War does not fulfil in me. The Southern War was revealing for what it said about Sir George Grey. When you compare Grey's handling of the Southern War to his predecessor, Governor Robert Fitzroy's handling of the Wairau Massacre, when he pardoned Ngāti Toa, deeming they had been unnecessarily provoked and would not be punished. This decision enraged the settler population, who viewed this incident as cold-blooded killing, but it did prevent any further conflict between Europeans and Māori because of the peaceful ne negotiation approach he took when dealing with the incident. When Grey arrived in Wellington in 1846 to sort out the problems between the settlers and local Māori, he did not bring a coffee table, as Fitzroy had done to peacefully resolve the issue. Instead, he brought 800 men, just as he had done in the Northern War. Just like in the Northern War too, Grey actively sought violence and conflict with the Māori as he knew the direct military conflict would result in a British victory and dispersal of the Māori from the area of conflict. When Grey allowed settlers to ransack Karapita Hills village on the 27th of February, he knew this would lead to conflict, as that was what he had wanted all along. This shows Grey's disregard for any land rights and purchases between settlers and Māori, and his belief that he could, with an army of stolen New South Wales soldiers, do anything to advantage his position as Governor of New Zealand. Historian Ranganui Walker, in his 2004 book, Struggle Without End, had this to say about Grey. Governor Grey, as hitman of colonisation, heralded the extension of Pakeha power into Māori districts. With settlers flooding in and clamouring for land, Grey moved to decisively try to meet the demand. Both his predecessors, Hobson and Fitzroy, took their seriously the first duty to protect the rights of Māori from settler land hunger. Hobson had appointed Protector of Aborigines. The job was to oversee the purchase of land that Māori people could alienate without inconvenience to themselves in accordance with Hobson's instructions. He then goes on to say, Grey in his instance was an author of colonial dispossession, the very process that humanitarians did not want repeated in New Zealand, end quote. This shows and confirms Grey's reckless actions and proves the part the Southern War had in revealing Grey's character as governor. To conclude, while the Southern War was not the most well-known or remembered conflict of the New Zealand land wars, it does have a great significance because of the implications it had for the development of the Wellington region and had a huge impact on the people at the time involved and still does today with the Crown and local Wellington iwi. Please subscribe if you're new to my channel, and if you guys enjoyed the video, please press the like button.